Happy Coinfest Blockchain Gaming Expo! So this afternoon we've got a few things coming. We're going to start out with uh, TapCoin, or the Tap Project, uh, which is a system for uh, taking existing game currencies between games, which is uh, something cool and will be useful right when it launches. I'm not sure of the status of that, but so it's a little bit of a different approach than what the usual uh, companies are doing where they're either making a game or tokenizing something in a the game. These guys are taking existing uh, things that are in games that we all use already and uh, trying to build a bridge for them. So super excited to hear from them. Uh, after that, uh -oh. after that, we're going to have a short break and then we're going to talk about AI in blockchain gaming with our friend Andrew Wagner, friend and creator of Pointless Andrew Wagner. And then we'll take another uh, short break and get into a uh, talk from BitNational. So right now, I'm going to bring up to the stage uh, from the TAP project. And I'm going to let him introduce himself because although we talked, I forgot to get the name. So, all right, here you go, man. Appreciate well, it. Thank you. Thank you guys, thank you. Uh, thank you guys for the invite, obviously, as well. I spoke to Andrew, and uh, this is something that we always want to come out and do. Uh, so I definitely appreciate it. So we'll get on to uh, the presentation. So one of the things I want to recommend is you won't be getting this today. This is uh, these guys are hype. Windows 95 launch, and I will not be doing that today. Just so everyone's clear. <laughs> um, so when we talked uh, to to Andrew, and we wanted to essentially get a little bit of a, a general uh, idea of the audience and type of audience that we we'll be speaking in front of today, and we were told there was going to be you know hardcore. Um, crypto users, uh, to beginner users, kind of anywhere from, from along those lines. So uh, when we do these types of presentations, we always try to ensure that we kind of fall in the middle of the gap and ensure that we kind of speak to both levels, uh, both the hardcore enthusiasts, the hodlers, so to speak, and those who are just kind of getting into the space. And this is an extremely great opportunity to kind of do something like this, uh, to kind of be out in the open and kind of Without any sort of stigma or anything like that. Um, so some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about today you might have heard. Um, some of the stuff might be generalized, and some of the things might uh, might make you think a little bit. Um, and one of the things that we ask when we're doing these things is when we are talking to uh, help us out a little bit uh, with some visual aids, whether it's you know frowning, looking at me, discouraged, uh, confused nodding your head, laughing at my stupid jokes, or you know, shaking your head, jumping out for joy. Something that gives me a little bit of an idea that I'm making some sort of impact, or what I'm saying is completely out of left field and is completely over your head. This, as I said, helps gauge, as Mr. SpongeBob says, gauge some sort of impact, and this can obviously help me out as I go through. So what I want to provide an introduction is uh, provide an introduction to myself and provide an introduction to a project. My name is Hannah Knight. I'm one of the co-founders of the TAP project. Uh, my brother and other co-founders as well, Hugh Knight, and my business partner as well, Noel Delay. We're all uh, essentially the team of the TAP project. And the TAP project is a, uh, a visionary goal that pushes the envelope of gaming by currently providing uh, gamers the additional source and opportunity to convert and transfer their in-game existing virtual uh, currencies into other games. We essentially allow the developers an additional uh, opportunity to earn revenue by each transaction that occurs every time a gamer converts one game to the next. For example, a quick example would be if you have um, 30 gold in WoW, and you want Call of Duty Black Ops points, you'll be able to convert that WoW into tap points, tap points into Call of Duty Black Ops points, and continue playing, advancing your opportunities in the game, and essentially getting more upgrades, continue playing with that. All this is done through our interactive digital media project called the Tap Platform. I know this video might not work, but, uh, or at least with sound, We'll do a test here. So as this video plays, uh, it essentially allows, as I said, for you to be able to gain currency, you win. I'm, I'm going to do the voice over here. That's a really good voice over so you guys want to watch it. 
watch it later, please do, I definitely appreciate it. By converting that currency into tap points, being able to gain that tap points, go into another game, Flashy animation there. Face on a boss, input the tap points into that game, level up. Yeah. And continue playing. So I know for uh, myself and the team, myself, you, and Mo, we can all speak that we are ginormous gamers. Uh, ever since the beginning of doing this, this is where we came into the space as gamers, not as developers, not as people fully understanding blockchain, but strictly as gamers. Because one of the things that we grew up is playing, you know, hardcore FPSers, uh, multiplayer games, whether it's classics like, you know, Zoo Tycoon, Roller Coaster Tycoon, AOE, Age of Empires, Command and Conquer. Um, I, the list goes on and on and on. We grew up playing those games, and so the idea came out, hey, all those games that we've played, everything that we've played, there's an opportunity here. We need to continue to advance the space, which is what essentially brought us here. That passion brought us to where we are today and brought us the TAP project. I can, I can probably say if you guys are gamers as well that you've probably earned millions, billions, if not trillions of in-game score, currency, digital coin, gold, gems, whatever it might be um, from a multitude of games. However, as I said, and I continue to pose, the question always becomes, what happens when the developer stops their servers? What happens when they push out a new game? All that currency score is gone, it's closed off, and it's no longer accessible. That desire pushed us to where we are. So I want to push up, um, I want to put up uh, a couple of gaming slides here. And obviously, for those who are in the industry, you guys have seen these time and time again. But the gaming industry and obviously the crypto industry are huge billion dollar industries. In 2018, uh, we slated about $137 billion in revenue total altogether. And that is huge. We obviously know the market cap of crypto. So combining these two industries is a very uh, dynamic opportunity for change here. This does not uh, kind of include esports because that is getting Huge, and I just want to give a shout, a foul out to, shout out to uh, Vancouver Titans, OWL Stage One champions. So that's pretty big for our series or for our, our town. I know the activities are extremely happy about that after purchasing them, buying with Luminosity Gaming, whatever. But that's huge for us, and esports is obviously going to only continue to grow. So over the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes or whatever we might have it, I want to obviously talk about. Uh, what is, in our opinion, the future of uh, blockchain gaming and the value proposition that is uh, possibly needed along the way. So what makes uh, blockchain important? We all know kind of how blockchain has started and kind of whether it's used as a decentralized uh, ledger system or whether it's combined with cryptography or anything like that and how it's emerged over the last 10 years. Um, and like gaming, it is important to understand kind of where uh, that it's, it's comparisons to Bitcoin, which emerged out of, and I'll slow down here, which emerged as a, out of a trustless system, which emerged, sorry, as a trustless system in an opportunity of mistrust. And that was due to the financial crisis that happened in 2008, spawned kind of the push for people to build their own trustless trust, so to speak, and get away from you know big banks and big uh, big industries controlling their things. And like that, I want to make I want to make the leap that blockchain gaming has the opportunity to do that as well. It's emerged as a as a trustless system in a way, in an effort to move away from those uh, developers who have a continuously um, hampered gamers or continuously you know, stifle them or trip them or continuously launch different things. You know, um, I'm a huge Marvel vs. Capcom fan as well. Uh, we're straight in from, D, uh, uh, from Dreamcast. And one of the things I was extremely sad about what Capcom did was a couple years ago was when they launched out Marvel vs. Capcom, and I think it was Marvel vs. Capcom 3, and then maybe like two months later, they pushed out Marvel vs. Capcom Ultimate. And I was like, what the hell? And all they did was launch a few more characters and that, obviously, as a gamer, that 
how can I continue to buy and support items and, and, and companies like that when they do things like that? So these, I'm trying to make the gap that blockchain gaming has kind of arrived out of that as well. When we kind of combine the opportunities that blockchain and gaming can, can do together, we arrive at the opportunity that digital assets can be moved and stored on an external server that is not controlled by the company. And that in itself is huge. Once you weed through all the hype of market caps and all the hype of you know Bitcoin's uh, amounts and, and you know, blood days and green days and whatever you might call it, um, you read through all that hype. It's truly interesting thing about blockchain right now is that we're almost in a space of R and D, research and development. I know some of you might might think a little bit differently, but the idea of research and development refers to innovative activities undertaken by organizations in developing new services, products, or improving existing services and products, which is what we, and I believe all of us here today, are essentially trying to do. Yep. Look at an idea, figure it out, push forward, develop it, whether it's an existing product that we use right now that we've thought, hey, there's, there's gotta be some better way to do this, or whether it's something that we're actually looking to change, and, and that's super cool. Um, let me let me be honest here. Um, as we know, there aren't a lot of use cases for blockchain currently right now. Um, but we have to understand that there are in this space there are tons of people trying to do different things. Whether it's they're trying to impact the legal field, uh, banking, finances, real estate, uh, gaming, healthcare, and more. These are industries that have extremely long legs. And, and I will be the first uh, to say, and you can we, we touch on this a little bit in our podcast that we do, uh, these are some people that have extremely long legs as well and very influential in the space. And it's beyond me, and I won't get into no um, conspiracies or anything like that, but it's beyond me as to whether or not they want these things to exist. At the end of the day, they do control a lot, but it's up to us to obviously continue to advance and to essentially force them into uh, changing their position, but these industries are very impactful and uh, have a lot. Whether it's trillion dollar industries or have a lot and potential to, uh, we essentially can change the tra trajectory as we know it. One of the cool things about the gaming industry is, and the gaming audience is, they're much more comfortable with change. We are. I am. I'm much more used to the fact that I can get a new game out every year, or I can get, uh, you know, used to. Microsoft or we uh, pushing on a system where I have to stand on it and I'm swinging my arms with like crazy standing and floating. I'm used to that. I'm used to kind of developing change or getting into something that's new or using a, a, a new technology. Because it's often seen in the gaming industry, if you're a developer that's not trying to push change, you're going to be left behind quite quickly. Especially in the age that we are currently right now with instant gratification, uh, you're going to be left behind as a, almost as a dinosaur, so to speak. And gamers are used to the fact that uh, there's digital currencies, assets, anything along those lines built into games and in-game economics from the pre-existing of games. So gamers are used to the fact that they have to, you know, grind for coin, they have to grind for skins. And if we do take this kind of uh, bird's eye view of games and kind of bird's eye view of, of design, there are a few things that run common with games. And one of the things that we focus on is, is in-game economics. For example, if you look at the currencies in games, they typically represent time or productivity to present value. And that time or productivity is generally used in a score, score base. So the longer you continue to play a game, the more score you earn. And our point and our focus is always seen to figure out what represents that score. How do we create some value? Because there is, whether it's realized value or unrealized value, there is tons of value just based on the, the data that the score presents for a player and a developer. It was up to us to kind of obviously look at that and take a deep dive into the project and look at every single game. Because there is, as I said, some information there. Even though you might not be able to see it right from the beginning, there is some information there that actually presents uh, provides an opportunity for advancements. 
whether it's in the way that developers price their items, whether it's in the way that developers um, calculate their unlocks, the time that's spent to get an unlocked, um, this is all represented in, in value. I'll give you a real life example. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are gamers, I assume so, but um, currently playing Apex Legends, try my hand at that. And uh, they just released uh, season one. And as a gamer, I was kind of like, well, let's take a look. I'm doing the project, I want to see kind of how they value people's times. I think they have 100 stages in season one to get uh, that magnificent Havoc skin, some gold, luxurious skin that you can get. And I think they give you about 70 days or so. I've been playing since the beginning of season one. I'm only at 26. Once I realize, as a gamer, do they actually value my time versus the money that I'm giving them? Remember, this is EA. And if anyone is EA here, I apologize. <laughs> but we know what they did in, in Star Wars Battlefront last year in 2017. I think it was 2017 when they tried to you know, charge $9.99 for Darth Vader or whatever you might call it. But paying a season's pass for $3 a month or whatever it might be to get up to 100 is that a realistic goal? Because as a gamer, if I realize that my time for the value that the item that I'm getting is, is non-existent, I will stop playing the game. As a gamer, we generally will. This, essentially, we are going to say, we weren't given enough time to get this item. We weren't given enough time to capture this item because in essence, on the other side, if it's too fast, if it's too fast, then we're going to beat the game quite quickly and not continue to play. So as it goes through, blockchain has the ability to extract the hidden value uh, provided by developers and provide the opportunity for players to export that unrealized value. It's at a point that we need to say, in our mind, when are we going to stop you know, cramming the star item into the circular hole. As an elementary school kid, that's when we were all taught, you know, put the circle hole, put the circle object in the circle hole. When are we going to stop doing that? By forcing, I'm going to take this jump on the other side, by forcing blockchain into games by not realizing that we can take little bits and pieces of it and we can incorporate it in a way that will flourish a little bit better. This is in our opinion where we will see, where we will essentially reach the evolution of blockchain and gaming rather than the revolution of blockchain and gaming. Long term for us, it's about a hybrid model of blockchain and games where blockchain is a catalyst that inspires true ownership and trustless trust into a system that's so bothered by mistrust. We personally believe, and this is why we kind of put this item up here, but we personally believe that there's an opportunity for creating a nucleus of gaming. And I'm not a subatomic particle expert or anything like that. For those of you who are, please let me know after and I'll move further. But the nucleus is where protons and neutrons live in harmony while the electrons are essentially orbiting outside. I'm going to make the gap and the jump that whenever these uh, neutrons or electrons are removed, this is where we create problems or it becomes unstable. But currently, I'm going to make the gap that we are trying to force a negatively charged electron into a positively charged neutron. When the thought needs to remain, how do we make blockchain the subatomic neutron that allows blockchain to uh, live harmoniously and essentially go to a common goal? As previously stated by James Mayo, in any game design, you have layers and places that you put bits and pieces of data. For example, you put data in the graphics card that runs the graphics for the game, and you put data on the processors, and then some data goes on the drive, hard drive, and so on and so forth. It's the same thing with blockchain. We'll have to figure out the way that this sort of data model speaks and how it works, and we have to incorporate it in the right places at the right time. I know a lot of you guys are trying to push uh, projects fully on blockchain, and I'm not you know, going against that or anything like that. I'm just trying to speak to a model that um, I believe as a gamer for myself uh, would work. So please continue if you guys are doing fully developed blockchain. Don't let me hinder you or anything like that. 
As gamers ourselves, this opportunity for uh, a change is has the opportunity to be widely accepted on a broader scope and easier for adoption. If it comes to an opportunity where I can jump up for joy to be able to throw in my Modern Warfare 2, download all my skins, all my fall skins that I worked so hard to get, convert that into uh, tap points, so to speak, push it into another game, and continue playing, that's where I believe I've reached a source of happiness for myself, and that was where I came in, uh, into this space. I'm not so much focused on the full opportunity of blockchain currently at the moment, because as a gamer, I understand that there is going to be testing periods, and there is going to be trials and tribulations in terms of if this is not going to work, if I'm going to stand on this meet again, or if I'm going to move on. One day, uh, it'll be understood that some components of blockchain integrated into a game will, will no longer be a catch phrase, but would rather be if your game does not have any sort of blockchain integrated in it, uh, you're kind of falling behind. And this is where we need to reach. Speaking to developers currently right now, they, their biggest thing is who, who else is doing it? We want to push through that and get into why aren't you doing it? Hopefully, as I said, we'll get into a point where gamers are looking at brands and saying, hey, you guys don't have any blockchain integration here, I'm going to move on to the next. Because we know in a time and industry where there is heavy competition, this snowball will rapidly go down the hill. One of the things as well when looking at blockchain, and this is something that I'm going to just pose as a question, it's not an answered question that we figured out, but it's something that we're trying to look into. How do you truly dive down into the blockchain data? How do you really get to the point where you're actually understanding and reading it as, a, as data for itself? Can you imagine the day um, that we reach back? You notice who made that quote, right? It's me. It's kind of a joke. <laughs> but can you imagine the day where we look back and you'll see me standing here right at this exact moment and you'll remember me saying, the day will come when we realize we're holding the hammer upside down. It's joke itself that I made that statement. I'm already claiming it. But can you imagine the, the light bulb going off when we realize that we've actually been interpreting blockchain data just based on a visual standpoint? We haven't actually been looking at the data for itself. There's so much data being produced on blockchain, but in our aspect, we're only scraping the level. And we don't have the answer, but this is this is something that I urge you guys to continue to express and continue to research and actually focus on. So to finish up kind of with, uh, with the talk and kind of open up any sort of questions that we're going to you know, posing as well, I honestly don't know where the outlines or what aspects of blockchain to me are. I don't know what the next you know, five years are going to be or where it's going to be. But what I do know is hindsight is always 2020. We're always going to look back and we're always going to say, why didn't I think of that? Oh, that was so easy. Oh, who would have thought of that? But hindsight is always 2020. And I urge you guys to continue developing, continue pushing the envelope. Yes, there are pros and cons, but look at the models of hybrid models versus full metric. Continue developing and we can only grasp what blockchain will do for us. So I can't stand here and say, I know where blockchain is gonna go, I know where gaming is gonna go, I know where Bitcoin is gonna go, but I can say that we are gonna play a pivotal role in that and only we can do that ourselves and continue to do that. So I'm gonna just you know, open up the time for questions. I'm gonna ask my, uh, my co-founder as well to, to jump up on stage if you guys do have any questions to be answered. And I definitely appreciate the time and sorry for the technical difficulties earlier. Um, and thank you guys. All right. Awesome. All right, guys, thank you so much. Just have fun. I'm sorry, I missed the so was, as soon as I walked back in from my quick breaks, I was like, oh, you got to go back and watch this later. This is just for you. So I will definitely be doing that. Uh, we're going to take about a 10-minute break, and then we're going to hear from a, uh, from Andrew Wagner about AI, AI and blockchain gaming. And uh, for those of you watching online, we're just going to meet the stream for about 10 minutes. And for uh, everyone here, maybe go check out some of the carnival games. Woo!
Yeah, we have balloons. We can go check out some of the carnival games outside and uh, see everybody in about 10 minutes.
Welcome everybody back to CoinFest Vancouver Blockchain Gaming Expo Afternoon Edition. Uh, before we hear from Andrew, I want to give one another quick shout out to our sponsors and all the awesome boosts here and the people that helped us support. So we have our global sponsors, iSign Exchange and Horde Exchange. Horde Exchange, not actually an exchange, right? We will, yeah. Oh, they will, okay. Lots of exchanges sponsoring this year. Also got Binational National here, Symmetria as a sponsor, uh, Engine Coin, GeoCoin, Coin Droids, Tap Coins here. I'm not sure if they sponsored, but Shout out to them for giving a good preach. They did. Good job, Tap Coin. <laughs> all right, and that sounds like our own. If I forgot any, I'll get them in the next round. And now we're here with Andrew Wagner on blockchain gaming and the role of artificial intelligence. So, welcome, Andrew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I think, yeah, next slide. He's my next slide clicker. We don't have a clicker thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. man. So, uh, some of this, because uh, I know the blockchain gaming space has evolved a lot especially since crypto critties kind of made NFTs a huge fat. Uh, so some of this will take a bit of background to understand what I'm talking about. So we have a brief history lesson. Uh, yeah, next slide. So this one, who knows this game? Oh, it is. This is called Monocoin. So this game was interesting. This was early on, a lot of people were trying to make their games more decentralized than we see with typical NFT non-fungible games now, most of them use a server, but some were trying to make them purely decentralized. This was one attempt that failed for a particular reason. They use proof of play. So the person who mined the next block, solved it, got the reward, in this system was the one who beat the level first. So instead of the one who solved the math problem first or staked the most coins, blocks are mined by players. Here's the problem with that. If you're too good at the game and you win twice in a row, you can 51% attack the network, right? So now we're in a situation where we can't have one player too dominant if we want to use the system. In reality, he used an artificial intelligence. He rapidly took over and crashed Motocoin. He could mine multiple blocks in a row. He was, and the AI was too good. He would beat the level in like seconds. So it was unplayable for humans, basically. Um, next slide. I need a signal like this or something. This is my next slide signal. This one's Hunter Coin, similar concepts. They're trying to make their game fully decentralized. And again, AI is a huge weakness, weak point when you attempt to do that. Similar concept here, they don't actually have proof of play, but they do have human mining. So this is a fully decentralized world. It's called Hunter Coin. Uh, the whole world's on the blockchain, every character, every tile. So when you play this, your transactions, instead of saying like minus X to my coin balance, plus X to his coin balance, it's saying stuff like uh, plus two to my X coordinate, minus one Y, kill that guy. No, it's all blockchain based commands and instructions, which is pretty cool. Uh, I mean, there, it has scalability issues, but a real issue was some new coins are dropped on the map for you to fight over. That's how new hunter coins would enter the world. So you have a hard incentive to take over the world of Undercoin, right? It's, uh, and when that exists, people will. There are some smart coders out there who don't want to leave home, and they just scour the internet for situations like this to exploit. Um, so we did. This is pseudonymous, like Bitcoin. So we didn't know his real name. We called him the Dominator. A dude took over the world of Undercoin. He had an army of AI bots. Uh, kind of like in South Park, if you've seen the WoW episode, we all banded together and tried to defeat him, and we lost. Not like a separate part. He defeated us, so we forked the blockchain. So on the one fork, we undid the damage he caused and continued the game. And on the other fork, he continues to dominate the world of Undercoin, but no one plays on that branch, so the coins aren't worth much in that one, right? But at the end of the day, the problem was his manipulation. He used bots, basically. There are other issues, like this MMO has players only. You'll see, like, there are not many MMOs like that, or if in the long term. You'll see what I mean. Next slide, so cool. So we got to think of a ways, yeah, it's from Blade Runner. we got to think of ways to detect AI players. Um, and this is already done, to be honest, by Blizzard and people who do online games, but they have more tools at their disposal because they're using servers and centralized systems. Um, so you have to do this. If we can't detect the AI, AI players, proof of play is impossible, uh, which is sad in my opinion. I liked that concept. 
and people will take over the game. In Hunter Coin, it was thousands of dollars a day that the Dominator was making, just dominating the world of Hunter Coin. That's more. That's more than most of us make with real jobs, man. So it's we had to, but it's hard to catch them in an autonomous fashion. You know, these guys. Well, we can start to look at methods. Slide here. Yeah. Uh, it's easier, like I said, when you have a server to do this. And this is why the first blockchain online games are not all serverless yet, because of this fact. Um, well, you can pretty much, if you are to dev, you can pretty much, you already know these, these are the methods that catch players with bots. You know, like, if your bot doesn't sleep ever, that's kind of a red flag. Most people sleep. Um, if it has weird behavior, like typically, you know, sometimes they'll try to humanify their bot, but typically human players interact in ways and have memes. Like sometimes if I, was, I used to play on World of Warcraft, uh, the Doran server. I had the gyrocopter just, uh, you know, and you could see the bots. Uh, they just acted a little differently. You know what I mean? Like I could, how come he just killed a hundred boars in a row? Isn't he bored? Like only a bot would not get bored doing that or like a real someone. Um, but you get what I mean. We're using these methods. Uh, you can also, you know, if you're on Steam, it's a lot easier. Steam has your email and stuff. Uh, that requires more methods to duplicate fake accounts. Uh, long term, this interviews or forced interactions with human staff. I think at the end of the day, Blizzard and some MMOs have an actual guy who makes the final decision. Like he gets a note, like this might be a bot. Please bring your human eyes and observe it and tell us if, as the system says, it is a bot. We'll be like, yep, ban hammer. Uh, but again, how do you decentralize that? So we'll see. Slide. Yeah, who knows what a Turing test is? So yeah, you know the idea is we want to catch the bot. Obviously, it doesn't want to be caught. It's going to try to convince you it's a player. Uh, the Turing test. You know, typically the traditional method of doing this is with dialogue. So if this was an online game, a Turing test might consist of asking the player questions, seeing if his responses are strange. Uh, basically, it's a test to see if you can differentiate the AI player from the human player. And the thing about this is, you know, you could, a bot could fool a Turing test, but if a bot did fool a Turing test, it would have to be not too good at the game, right? It would have to have a human level of ability to pass the Turing test. So is it really that dangerous? If a bot can pass the Turing test, it's not going to be that damaging to the online game ecosystem. If it can pass the Turing test, it won't be able to dominate all the other players with its AI, right? If you make its reflexes too fast, then it gets noticed and banned. So there's some push and shove here. There's a balancing act going on. Um, what's really interesting, go to the next slide, can we decentralize the Turing test? Because if we could, we could catch them automatically in a game like Huntercoin, right? This is the real issue. How do we decentralize the process of screening for, filtering, and caching? privacy and preventing bot manipulation, which is more valuable. Obviously, it's in between somewhere, or some games might be more or less private and disagree on where that balance is. But we're all going to have to figure that out. I mean, I, as a middle ground, I think we could catch some bots in a pseudonymous system. You know, from the way they act, it would take a lot of work. But I'm, you know, I'm hesitant to say we should abandon all privacy on the blockchain the sake of bot catching. Uh, but it does look like that's, you know, double-edged sword there. Um, but I'm interested in how that evolves, like as smart contracts and things like that get more workable on privacy change, privacy chains that might start to change. Um, next slide. <coughs> Here's another one. We don't just want to catch bots in our game. Sometimes we want bots in our game. 
The world of Hunter Coin had no NPCs. Just think about it. The logic is difficult. Uh, you need, first of all, I mean, not all games need NPCs. Like, let's think, like a first person shooter, some online FPSs that can classify as MMOs don't need NPCs. But others do. Any RPG probably needs NPCs. Uh, if you play one, you know why. You can, you know, they drive the story. Uh, if you're playing by yourself and have no internet access, what are you gonna do? Uh, these are points. So, but in a decentralized world, doing that is difficult, right? You'll see scalability issues. And next slide. Uh, this happens. Um, like one time, someone tried to do chess purely on Ethereum, all on chain, like everything. And you need to I'll dial it back a bit because actually, just calculating the checkmate consumes so much Ethereum gas. Imagine trying to have an entire AI bot calculated on chain. It would be the most expensive smart contract ever made. Um, you could have a simple bot like X position plus one every turn, like maybe. The NPC is a critter that just goes back and forth on a path. That's not so bad, right? But any level of strategic element it gets difficult, right? And it's also think think through an online MMO you may have played. What percentage of the characters were NPCs and what were humans? Right? They can generate a lot of noise if they're all doing stuff on chain. Um, there's more of them than humans in many online worlds, and uh, they don't sleep. Unless, you know, there are some worlds where when no humans in the zone, they're disabled. Like, I think World of Warcraft did that to us, where if we leave and come back, everything's reset. And that can make that not as damaging. Um, and then the logic thing is this, this is a competitive game. Like, if we're at a highly competitive level, and the AI's logic is on chain, you know how it will respond to your actions. If we did that in Hunter Coin, Dominator would be like, you silly guys, and you just went because he would program a response to know its program responses, and it can't do the same back to him. Um, so there are issues we have to learn how to tackle. Um, next slide. And looking at how we can do that, you know, I've seen two different theories on how to move down that route. Uh, one is, um, you know, and these theories all came from guys on the Huntercoin team when I was talking to them, like how do we get some like critters running around? You know, something to fight. Um, one idea I saw floated around in their community was uh, have humans who run bots for the game. There's trust problems here. You know, we need some kind of incentive system. Or what if we had a permission system? Well, there's two permission levels, player and bot manager. You know, some person. That would require, though, sustainable token economics for the bot, or no one would agree to do that. We had some, like if the bot took part in the game ecosystems, like say the bot was a fisherman, you know, like World of Warcraft fisherman, he goes to the dock and back. Maybe the bot owner could get proceeds of whatever activity it was generating. Uh, that's the idea some people are going down. The other ones, I kind of like this. Uh, in Huntercoin, there are some things that are stored on the blockchain and some not. Basically, you need the final things on chain. Like, for example, um, if we have an AI, what needs to be on chain is what it did, when it did it, to whom. It doesn't matter why, because if two bots do the same thing every day in the same situation, does it matter if they used a different algorithm to arrive at their final act? It doesn't. All that matters from the player's perspective is, did these two bots do the same thing? So in that regard, uh, it doesn't require all the logic of the bot's processing to be on chain. It requires his final committed transaction. And the other players, so if the other players have a copy of all that code on their local game client, they'll know if you came out and made a move that doesn't jive with what the code says, right? If you store the AI code locally on your machine, you can also, your machine can also process how that bot should have responded in that situation. And you can detect any lies. Um, that's what I think is going to happen. We're probably going to see, uh, and it's similar like in Huntercoin, for example, Huntercoin stores the graphics on the local client uh, and other aspects of it, things that you won't argue about. 
Like if your graphics are green instead of blue, I'm still going to kill you. It doesn't matter. Um, it matters things that could come to an arbitratable dispute. Um, I think, you know, so you need some kind of side chain or local storage type concept. Uh, there's some people trying to do that. The Hunter Coin guys are making a chain called Zaya trying to do that. Um, and I'm pretty sure someone's going to try to do that on Ethereum in its totality soon. Because you could probably do this with most major blockchains. You just, like, imagine a world where, like, Ethereum stores final acts, but we put the AI code in a local client. Like, so the game client, not the blockchain client, which are separate in these worlds, right? Like if you play Spells of Genesis, which I have, you download the wallet client and the game client. Or if you have more than one games to one type of wallet or developer, it becomes an ecosystem. Um, so I'm really fascinated about this because I want to see this, uh, because of bots are autonomous, to me, this makes it feel more meaningful. Like, what do I care about slaying a bot in the World of Warcraft? It's just going to reset. You know, it's not persistent. Killing a bot in a decentralized world kills it. You know, it, it has a life almost. It runs autonomously on the blockchain. Uh, so things can be more epic sometimes when battles come to a head or feel more consequential, right? There's no one you can be like, mod, help, I'm being griefed. You know, there's no that sometimes. So it can feel like, you know, sometimes in World of Warcraft, you Alliance and Horde would fight each other. Like, I go to a Horde town and slay a bunch of noobs for no reason. I'm like, ha ha ha. And then a powerful Horde guy would come save the day and, like, try to kill me to defend the noobs in his town. Things like that would be more meaningful. You'll need him to come save you from me because the mods can't in a game some of these fully decentralized things. But we're just, until we can automate all these systems, we can't really do that yet. I think I'm running out of slides. Let's see. Yeah. Guys, got any questions? Anyone? Alex? I was gonna take my oh, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. So thank you so much, Andrew, for that awesome talk and a uh, good little history lesson, actually. A lot of people didn't know about the old uh, the evolution of the really early blockchain gaming. It's kind of hilarious. Um, yeah, the hundred coin story is always epic because there was no comeback. <laughs> there was only a port. So we're going to take another quick 10-minute break, then we're going to hear from Drew, who I have not been able to locate in the last couple of minutes to tell him he's up next, but I did tell him about half an hour ago. So we'll be back in about 10 minutes with uh, Drew from BitNational, and uh, yeah, see you guys then.
And welcome everybody back. We are back, so we're going to need to go quiet down in the front. You guys over there, we're going to need you to quiet down in the front so your voices don't come to the live stream. All right, so uh, this afternoon we're going to talk about brokerages and exchanges with uh, Vancouver's very own Drew. He is uh, awesome and a member of the DDP, so we'll have a little, a little dance party tomorrow. I think he might be there for sure. So uh, Drew uh, from BitNational, one of our sponsors, is going to talk about uh, brokerages and exchanges in the crypto space. All right, thank you, Drew. Thank you. Uh, so I've been... Uh, an active leader in the crypto space for six years now. I've got uh, about 50 ATMs across British Columbia and Alberta, uh, over the counter trading desks in Vancouver, Calgary, and we're launching an online exchange actually in the coming weeks here in April. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be talking about cryptocurrency exchanges and brokerages and how you can use them. So, the first question is why do we use them? So these are platforms that allow anyone direct access to different cryptocurrencies. Uh, as soon as you're on an online exchange or using a brokerage, you instantly have an interface to uh, acquire cryptocurrencies, whatever the brokerage may offer, or the various coins that exchanges offer. Some of them offer hundreds, some of them offer four or five. So you get a, a wide array of um, different varieties of coins, and some exchanges will suit your liking better than others, so it's definitely up to the user's preference. Um, they're obviously very much safer than getting somebody uh, in a coffee shop or a uh, back alley or however you want to meet somebody off of Craigslist or any of those online platforms that sometimes have nefarious actors on them, so you definitely want to be safe about that. Um, and they, they even the ability to decide when and what to buy. So you can see the prices live, real time, and uh, make your decisions accordingly at that point. What they do have uh, is liquidity. So in a marketplace, hopefully that has uh, a large amount of users, you're gonna have uh, larger liquidity, um, better pricing, so you can actually buy larger volumes at a decent price. Yeah, they, they give you the full disclosure of the prices and fees, and uh, instead they give you the ability to buy large quantities. So it's uh, an interactive way to get into the crypto space. Um, you're able to trade with peers on exchanges in a controlled environment that is safe. You're not at risk of losing your funds. And uh, yeah. you can learn to turn speed with these. So if uh, you're new to this space, you're able to uh, get into this and not uh, risk your money. You can uh, simply, you know, truck start small, five, ten dollars, twenty dollars, uh, whatever works for you, so that you're not uh, potentially going to make a mistake and gamble your money or uh, put it in the wrong place. And you can't be forced to do anything on an exchange uh, that may risk your funds. It's all at your fingertips. You're controlling when you're putting in your bids uh, and what you're deciding to buy. You have to see your transactions from start to finish. So you're obviously aware of what's going on through the chain. And if you're withdrawing these funds, you'll be able to see if they're, they're being processed, if there's a, an issue with um, the delivery of your cryptocurrency, the exchange can contact you or you can contact the exchange so it's, it's a really safe way to actually acquire cryptocurrency because you're, you're guided through the whole process really. And uh, you can definitely be confident that you're not being scammed. Uh, as hopefully you're, you're trading with a reputable exchange or brokerage. So how do exchanges work? In my opinion, it's the most interactive way to trade in the cryptocurrency space. Because as I said before, you're actually setting the bids, you're deciding which market you want to buy in. You can trade from one cryptocurrency to another. 
you can trade from Canadian dollars to cryptocurrency or reverse. So uh, yeah, you, you're getting the, the best options. And also it, it provides a lot of practice uh, with guidance and most exchanges should have a strong knowledge base. So you're able to actually, if you don't understand how a process works or what a certain uh, trade order is, you should be able to uh, understand that. And if uh, they don't have an answer for you, they should be able to provide you with one if you request it from them. So as I said, you, you control the price. You're, you're in full control. You get to decide right down to the penny or right down to the Satoshi uh, what value you actually want to commit to trading. And at that point, um, you know, you, you've, made the, you've made the bid and you can uh, see where that goes for yourself. If somebody does decide to pick up your order, then uh, you successfully made a trade. Um, you can also conduct quick buys on exchanges. They'll have the option where uh, you can just click one button for a certain denomination and instantly have that cryptocurrency added to your wallet, traded for your Canadian dollars or the like. And also, if, if you're actually on the exchange and you're not satisfied with the current market price and you think the market may drop, then you can set a much lower bid and then hopefully it fills in a little bit of a market dip. Or if you're looking to sell high, then you can also set that. It doesn't need to execute immediately. It can sit in the order book and add to the liquidity of the exchange's order books. Why would you use a brokerage? It, it really comes down to how it can be fast, simple, and friendly. You're, you're actually engaging with a person um, at, a, at an office, or uh, some people still do it privately through coffee shops, but they're reputable. It's, it's definitely a, a, a worthwhile option because it is a personal experience. You're actually meeting someone uh, face to face and you can be confident that your trade is going to be completed. Yeah, you can get educated from the experts in the space, um, but be careful about who you're trusting, obviously, and do your own research uh, accordingly. And uh, it gives you the ability to learn new things and get involved in a greater capacity. Um, most brokers will know about local meetups and uh, other ongoing things in the crypto space in their regions. Is on like education with brokerages. I, I think that's a huge thing, and that's why my company especially has decided to go that route, is because you want to understand what you're doing. This is your money, this is your livelihood, and you should feel comfortable and safe in the cryptocurrency space. You shouldn't be um, you know, thinking that you might be losing your money or you're getting into a situation that you don't want to be. It's at your own pace, and if you feel comfortable, uh, the, the best part of OTC in my mind, asking the questions. And who should you trust? This is uh, a lot as we're uh, exchanges and brokerages are asking for trust in a system that is supposed to be trustless. The blockchain is the ultimate decider of how things go, and you can see those transactions on the blockchain. So you definitely want to be doing it with somebody that you uh, can trust. You should feel safe and confident with all your decisions and definitely go with your gut. If it doesn't feel right, then don't do it. Um, these people should be helpful. They should be willing to uh, give you all the information you're asking for so that you're not feeling at risk with your funds. For exchanges especially, it, it makes sense to go with local. You don't want to be sending your money to some bank in uh, Eastern Europe or uh, I know Puerto Rico, especially they had a, an account in Poland, I think a lot of people were sending money to for a while and uh, all over the world actually. So yeah, like especially in Canada, you want, obviously your money is in Canadian banks, they're well trusted around the world, so it makes sense to use an exchange that has a Canadian bank account. Um, yeah, you need to be able to contact these people easily. If, if they don't have a phone number, they don't have 
um, easy email addresses. They don't have a location where you can actually find these people. It's probably a bad sign that you might not want to use them. I know there's a few exchanges that definitely don't give as much information as they should. So definitely pay attention to that. And I can't stress that enough. They, they shouldn't hide anything. Um, how do they store your cryptocurrency? You should know that. It shouldn't be in one guy's laptop um, that could potentially go missing or something happen to him and all of a sudden everybody's money's gone. So especially nowadays, like there is multi-signature wallets that are fairly accessible and they should be implemented. There should be uh, above board protocols with that exchange so that you know if even the two founders or the three founders or directors do pass or something happens, that your funds are secure, that you're not at risk. So that's a, a big thing that I should stress there. And how do they store your fiat currency? As I said, it's obviously the safest in a Canadian bank for Canadians. Uh, it makes sense to not have your money be leaving the country so that you're going to be faced with uh, difficulties getting your money back if you actually run into difficulties with the exchange. Yeah, and you should be able to actively see what they have for their protocols for keeping your cryptocurrency and your fiat currency. And if they do have an audit process, it's even more beneficial because, you know, a third party is actually reviewing their books and your funds are actually there. They're not being siphoned off to somebody's personal bank account or something, which we've all seen in the past. <laughs> Many of you are aware of uh, Mount Gox and uh, others. So the physical presence is also a big thing. As I said, where, where do you find these people? Do they have a public address? Can you actually go meet their staff? Um, be, be able to contact these people easily. It just shows that they're, um, shows that they're more willing to be legitimate in the industry and uh, you know, not hiding behind a website with no address, no phone number, and just expecting you to send them your money and uh, hope for the best. So you're looking for well-established exchanges as well. Uh, there's a lot of companies that have been around uh, now for, you know, five, six, seven years even, some of the exchanges. So I definitely advise sticking with them and uh, until the younger, um, newer exchanges prove themselves, then uh, it's best to stick to the, the older, well-established guys. Are they helpful? Do they know what they're talking about? You should be able to get information from them and then double check it yourself to ensure it is accurate, that uh, you're getting the best possible information and uh, not receiving anything false or uh, if they're directing you to a scam or something like that. The internet is a very valuable resource for cryptocurrency. Um, there's always uh, new things happening in the crypto space, obviously, very quickly. So you need to stay on top of things and make sure that you're not getting ripped off. Um, yeah, their staff should be present in the community, um, you know, like hosting community events, engaging in CoinFest, other um, cryptocurrency dominant events that uh, happen all around the world uh, on a growing scale. There seems to be a lot more cryptocurrency conferences popping up every year, and hopefully that's the continued trend so we can continue on with getting adoption growing faster. And if they have any accreditation of their services, um, that's also beneficial for sure. Um, my company, actually, the National, we're the first cryptocurrency company, to my knowledge, to be Better Business Bureau accredited in Canada. So um, it's, it's about taking steps in the right direction to uh, kind of mesh with the existing world and uh, yeah, just provide legitimacy to this space that is kind of wishy-washy dark to some people as this magical internet money does continue to grow. That about sums it up for what I need to say. Um, I'll open it up if there's any questions about exchanges or brokerages.
No questions. We got a bunch of experts. <laughs> Perfect. We already All right, thank you, Drew. Cheers, guys. Another question, Nick. Uh, right after, uh, aggressively Nate, you got to ask them soon. All right, so we got one more uh, quick break. We're going to break something we want to talk today, which is something in been enough conferences you know is required. And then we're going to hear from uh, Cointroids. And then uh, I think we might be moving into the long break after that, in which case we're all going to get in the money machine thing outside. Uh, yes, Cointroids, then our long break. And we're all going to take rounds in the money spinning air machine. So we'll see you guys in 10 minutes for Cointroids. Okay, she's got this slides. Slides? 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 Uh, I mean, if I could just mimic that setup, that we're just going to do. Um, what do you do?
All right, we are back, CoinFest, getting near the uh, afternoon long break. Uh, we got one more presentation by CoinDroids, another uh, pretty old school game that's been around a while, or at least the people building it have been around a while. Both of those things true? Both of those things. Both of those things are true, yeah. So one of the older uh, pioneers before everything was just thrown on Ethereum. Don't okay. no offense. <laughs> All right, so uh, Josh from CoinDroids is going to talk about CoinDroids, so thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, so, like uh, Andrew's last talk, this will probably be more of a history lesson than anything. Um, but uh, it's a little weird to say because we do certainly still exist. I got the, I got it, yeah. Uh, sorry, our, our tech team wanted to know who was going to change the slides, uh, but I'm going to take it in my own hands. Um, so yeah, Corey Droids has been around a while. Um, yeah, it's working, sweet. All right. Um, so, before getting too much into what CoinDroids is at a, at a game level, uh, we care a lot about our lore, and I think our lore makes the game make a lot more sense when you get into it. So what I'd like to do is start with a bit of a story of, of the, the beginnings of, of how CoinDroids actually came to be. Um, so, long, long ago, uh, a gentleman had many CFO friends and he was watching them with despair as they tried to handle the accounting for their large companies. And he thought there must be an easier way. So what he wanted to do was create an AI that would help his friends do their accounting for their organization. Unfortunately, what he didn't expect is that these bots, as they did the accounting magnificently for these organizations, they eventually learned that really money is the true power. But they kind of missed a step and took it a little bit too seriously. So what they ended up doing as they overthrew the human race is actually they started shooting money at each other. They just cut out the middleman of explosives and just went straight to economic warfare by throwing money around. And that is the concept of coin droids. In coin droids, you battle with money. You throw your money at another person and you hope to kill them so that way you can win their bounty. That is how CoinDroids works. That's a little bit of a manifesto there. Uh, as much as this is a teaching tool, it is not an easy game to play. It is not friendly. That's a bit of a problem, but it is what it is. Um, but we also take it in stride. We think it's fun this way. We like creating puzzles for people that no one will ever solve. And when someone does solve it, it's a very exciting day. So a little bit of a history now that in the lore of the game, where we're coming from here, just literally robots thinking that they should throw money at each other. Uh, many years back, um, around 2013, we were toying with, okay, how do we, how do we do something fun with this technology? What can we do with that? Now keep in mind, 2013, there was no Ethereum mainnet. This is not like there was, people ask, well, why didn't you create a smart contract? Because it didn't exist. It's not something we could do at the time. But that was fine. But what someone did do, uh, I was a frequenter and continue to be a frequenter of a conference called DEF CON. And if you don't know what DEF CON is, DEF CON is the largest hacker conference in the world. Uh, it's where a bunch of nerds come together to break crap and drink too much in Vegas for a couple days. I've been running some contests there for a while and was looking for the next thing to take up too much of my time. And someone decided to release a cryptocurrency related to the conference, not officially, uh, called DeathCoin. So, great. I'm going to make a contest out of DeathCoin. I'm going to find a way to make a game that would help seed the community so people would have a way of one getting into this technology, checking it out, and, and seeing how that goes. Um, historically, DeathCon hated Bitcoin. And I'm going to say Bitcoin because, again, it wasn't blockchain at the time. It was Bitcoin. That's all we had. People hated it. They absolutely hated it. Every time you mentioned it, heaven forbid it took over the word cryptography. Oh, no. Crypto is cryptography. Yes, we get it. Crypto is cryptography. Understood. This is a really cool application of it. So you had people coming to the conference, and, 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 and we wanted to bring them a game that would actually give them a chance to see this technology for what it is and see what it's like to have your first crypto and, and 
transferred around and, and understand what all that meant. Luckily, DEF coin was worthless. So we could give it away, we could help people um, have their, install their first wallet, get it all installed, get their first tokens, and then start interacting with our game and hopefully maybe make a little bit extra or lose some. We wanted to make sure that the game wasn't gambling because we were in Nevada and I wasn't licensed to have any sort of gambling. So I didn't want, we were in a casino, so I didn't want like the Caesars guy knocking down my door saying like, hey, come with us. That did not interest me at all. So we made sure that the game was purely skill-based. We wanted no random at all to be in it. Every single action you take in the game, you can calculate exactly how much damage you're gonna do. You can calculate, you know exactly how much health they have. What you don't necessarily know is what other players are going to do. So that's really the only external random coming in. So we made it. And again, this kind of started late 2013 with just like shooting ideas around. Early 2014 is when we actually started putting some things into play. And then 2014, around August, is when we went to our first Vegas trip and, and actually posted it there. Um, having people run around and actually scan QR codes that we had on each other's arms, that you had each other's address to attack, winning funds and stuff, people seemed to really like it. So we kept going with the idea. Keep in mind, again, we didn't have we didn't have Ethereum, we didn't have EOS, we didn't have all these other technologies to really take on. We could have done counterparty assets, but we wanted to kind of simplify our life. And so we, 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 cent we centralized a lot of the service. When you send money, when you're shooting money at a droid in CoinDroids, you're sending money into the CoinDroid system. The CoinDroid system is running logic based on what that, app, what that user is, and then it's, return, it's sending a payout if that person actually wins any money. Um, throughout the history, you can see no ICOs, no ICOs, and then again, recently we have no plan to do an ICO. It's just not our thing. There's no reason to do it. We're just robots shooting money at each other. We don't need like a new money. We don't need like an ammo token. Uh, it's just for us. It's Deathcoin. It's Litecoin. It's Dogecoin. Most recently, we were happy to add that one. Uh, we do support Bitcoin. It's an awful experience. Because I send an action and I have to wait like a day for it to confirm, or I have to spend like nine dollars to commit a like fourteen cent attack. It just doesn't make sense, unfortunately. That's been really frustrating because when we started this game on Defcoin, Defcoin was a copy and paste of Bitcoin. So we were hoping, great, you know, if this game takes off, we'll just switch it over to Bitcoin. Now, by the time we were ready to support Bitcoin. Bitcoin was in no way, shape, or form ready to support us. And generally, when you bring that up to anyone in that community, it's, well, then you're not our use case. Great. So I'm not their use case. That's fine. We moved on. Litecoin is fantastic. Dogecoin is fantastic. They're happy to have us. Both of our users love it. This is the team. Uh, I'm the one on the top left there. Uh, it's not just me that has put this game together, uh, especially when it comes to anything art-based, uh, but also uh, making sure that the game is balanced in a way. Again, we're fighting real money here. You are sending your hard-earned Litecoin, your hard-earned Dogecoin, and hoping to get some back. So we wanted to make sure that the game was balanced in a way that it's fair. Um, and there was a fun talk about botting earlier on. I'm going to get to that later. We love it. We've got really good people working with us. And we actually, despite the fact that we're probably holding a whole two hundred dollars in the system worth of cryptocurrencies, even after the seven years of existence, we take security obnoxiously seriously um, because most of us are security professionals who are working on the team. So it's kind of our proof of concept to figure out how to do it right. That way, we can get then go to clients and actually give them a good way of doing it. So that's been kind of fun, and at least. Regardless of it not making us money, it certainly helped us over the time. I'm going to keep talking because someone's trying to take a picture of this slide right now, and then once that's done, I'll move on. <laughs> so I just mentioned the thing about bots. We've gone out of our way to make sure that bots have a place in this game because we can't fight them. They will be there. Remember the lore of the game? It's about the bots taking over humanity. 
this is a legitimate thing that takes place. So we wanted to make sure that we wrote gameplay and balanced our gameplay in a way where even if you write bots, humans actually still have their own advantages in the game. And they might be different advantages, but as long as they can take, take full advantage of those, then there's still a balanced overall play. So we do believe that bots have a place. We do believe automation has a place in the game, and it's certainly something that we work towards. Um, but you can also just sit there and play and click and have a good time as well. Um, one thing that you'll see, you'll see these you know, slightly pretty front ends, um, but actually we wrote our API and the subsystem of the game long before we wrote the front end. So there's actually a lot more features behind the scenes that you don't really see. Really, Coindroids.com is more of a tech demo than anything. There's a lot going on under the scenes. So where do we come? Our first proof of concept was made by me, at least from a design perspective as well. It lacks some usability and pizzazz, um, but it got us accepted into DEF CON as a contest for the year. Uh, so that was nice of them to accept our black screen with the word register. Moving along, we made a website that looked at least kind of cool. Uh, so we got there, again, same year. Um, that was a mock-up, so it's got some crap data. But anyways, we moved on. Um, this was our first iteration, not based on the API, just like, oh my god, DEF CON is in four weeks. We have to start working on this. Let's make it happen. Um, we were a lot more looser in how we process it. We didn't care if we lost DEF CON. So if we sent out a payout, and then there was a rollback on the chain, and the attack never took place, we didn't really care, so what if we lost this? That was obviously something we needed to fix as we went forward. We had to figure out, okay, if we're on the Bitcoin blockchain and it rolls back and that attack never took place, we actually have to make sure our game state rolls back with the chain and forward with the chain constantly. So the, and luckily, DEFCOIN was a, as much as a network mess that we were able to experience thousands of blocks rolling back at the same time and just completely decimating our game state. It was a really fun experiment. Thanks. It's like working with testnet. If you can get anything working on testnet, then I guarantee it's going to work on mainnet because it's just such nonsense taking place. So I haven't even really shown you the game, but you, you get that we're just trying to throw money at things. So we like to add slightly more puzzles and stuff into it. Again, we're, we're usually doing this at conferences. So we get a chance of being in person and, and working with the conference itself. So the first year we did it, we had a bunch of different bosses hidden around the, hidden around the conference. Goon Man there in the red, uh, DEF CON is run by goons, they're called. It's the people in red shirts, they're generally 600 pounds and seven feet tall. They all have some sort of military background. Lovely people and horrifying. So if you wanted that one, you had to figure out a way to bribe them and get them to give up the address to know to attack them. T Mr. Tumbler, Dr. Tumbler over here, can't really see his tumbling hands. You had to go to the lockpick village at DEF CON and pick some certain locks, and then that would give you access to killing that droid. Uh, over here, this guy in the top left, that was a crypto puzzle, so you actually had to uh, decode the puzzle and, and figure out what the original message actually was underneath it. Um, and then the RCMP guy at the top, we've definitely stopped using because we don't want to anger the RCMP. <laughs> More recently, uh, we had fun with uh, CoinDroid's Haunt as we released Dogecoin support. Um, so we had just a whole month of, of Halloween activities. And then we had, uh, and this was online, and we had a, a, a King of the Hill type effort where you wanted to be the top droid at a certain day. Um, in that case, we also had some fun masks that you get for your droids. Your droids are customizable. We don't give out, or we centralize the assets. The assets are all stored in our database right now. Um, that will change in the future, I'm sure. Uh, but there are still fun customizations you can do in your droid to either make it more powerful or look way cooler, which is probably more important. We love Litecoin, so in the future, we're working on some sort of Litecoin-based challenges, whether or not they'll show up at a conference or online, regardless. We like hiding things all over the place. 
place. Be them on the internet, on random websites that don't seem related to us whatsoever. This is one of our fun ones that we're working on. And another one we've been working on for a while is to slay the bear whale, of course. And this will be a team effort that we all have to come by uh, working together to slay the bear whale. So again, we like, we like having fun with the crypto space. We've been in it for a long time. Um, but we don't like making it easy. So actually finding out what the hell this actually means, who knows? Good luck. Okay. So what does CoinDoors actually look like today? Now that I've talked to you for 10 minutes and you have no idea. So right now, as I said, basically a tech demo. There's a lot going on under the hood here. Um, but we have this nice little web page where I can go log in, choose my currency that I'm working with, flip in and out. Um, these are all different droids that I can attack right now. I can see what their bounty is. So if I want to attack Steve Irwin there, because I know that their bounty is, is, is high enough that I want to, I certainly want to have it. And I can calculate that I can spend less on the attack to win that bounty. Easy math. What I don't know is if I go to attack Steve Irwin, someone else in this room is going to attack at the exact same time. They might even be watching the mempool and, and looking for transactions so they can jump in and, and snipe those kills and, and screw me over. This is my profile. Uh, there's some Hunter S. Thompson going on there. Uh, that was uh, that was one of the prizes for uh, DEF CON uh, two years back. My droid is very nicely upgraded and looks very pointy, making it much more dangerous. Um, and you know, we just have fun with it. So, where do we end up going with this? Um, uh, we constantly get the question. You know, why aren't these assets? Why aren't there smart contract arenas? We're a centralized service. You got to trust us that we're going to actually pay that out. I think we're trustable people, um, but that doesn't really matter. Um, so we would love to move towards, you know, NFT assets. Um, but then it's about, you know, what chain do we care about? Uh, we've seen cats take down Ethereum pretty quickly. Um, EOS can be a bit of a dumpster fire, but there's some promise there. Apparently, Tron has great cars. Like, I don't know. There's a lot of options here. And the reality of it is we're going to use them all. We're going to create, we're going to create arenas in which you can use our assets and use our, use our balancing metrics to fight using Lightning Network. We're going to create contracts and, and battles within the EOS world. We're going to create even things on, on Tron or, or just the craziest things we can find, because that's what we're doing. Is we're creating weird puzzles that people will probably not find, because we're kind of, kind of and it's just fun for us. And this is the enjoyment we're getting out of it. We are hoping to bring some people on full time to, to work on this a little bit more seriously. Um, but unfortunately, Crypto Winner put a stop to that. So uh, on the plus side, we didn't do it, so we didn't go bankrupt. So we're still here. And I had a celebration with another gentleman earlier, but still around. So that's that's what we're all going for here. And we are still around, and we are still actively working on things, and we will continue to work on things. Yes, because it's a it's a labor of love. And, oh, come back. Just my contact slide here. So, I mean, if you want to get into Coindroids, I'm happy to walk you through it while we're here. Our main problem right now is that our onboarding process absolutely sucks. Just terrible. But if you'd like to learn how to get on in person and become our fourth or fifth user, then I would love to help you out. Uh, <laughs> number five gets a prize. So there is some contact details there. Uh, we do have a lot of documentation, perhaps too much documentation, I think is what I'm learning. Um, but there is a lot there, including on the API. This is not stuff that we hide, it's all there in the open. We like to be transparent about that. Although, as I've said, due to puzzles, things may change constantly. Um, now, we do have one more thing. Who knows? Maybe coin dogs is not too far off. So, that's all I've got. Any questions on corn droids? When lightning. When lightning? So, actually, I have an update for lightning. Because a year ago, I looked at the lightning network because everyone was telling me, you know, Bitcoin doesn't suck. It's the, you just got to be using the lightning network. Okay, I'll look at the lightning network. I'm fine. 
I'm excited about it too. I want it to work. I honestly do. So I spend my time researching. I'm like, okay, how do I send a transaction? Well, you've got to create an invoice. Okay. So if my robot wants to shoot you, I have to ask for a bullet invoice. Is that what's happening here? Like, hey, can I, can I, can I shoot you? Yeah, yeah, please. Here, here's your future. It doesn't make any sense at all. Now, Lightning Network has progressed. These things mature. Now, apparently, there there is technology in which I can send a transaction before someone gives me an invoice. So I can make fun of it, but they are working on it. They are improving. These things do get better in time. There is light at the end of the tunnel. We're still not there yet because now the problem is if someone puts, you know, five dollars into their lightning channel and makes a tax and wins an extra dollar, so they now have six dollars, they can't get six dollars. They have to put more money in. So we still have some more growing pains for the lightning network and I look forward to it working. Um, but at the same time, I only have so many hours in the day to research ridiculous crap. Um, so I have to like move on and then hope that they get better and then come back to it when, when, I, when we're ready to play around with it. So I look forward to it when the lightning. Any other questions? When plasma. When plasma. I've also screwed around with plasma. <laughs> um, yeah, that one's probably closer than lightning, uh, but it, it'll be a different gameplay. The, the one thing is, so, uh, the way CoinDroids works is every single block, we look at all the transactions in that block and any of them that relate to CoinDroids, all those attacks are considered to be taking place at the same time. So if we move to something even like Lightning or Plasma, now it's just a completely different gameplay, which is fine because we want our assets in our, in our universe to expand to different worlds and, and different play uh, use cases. That's totally something we're planning on, but we haven't figured out the exact mechanics that we want for a more kind of real-time actual gameplay. Any other questions? Can you guys play these games? Yeah. Oh, great question. For all the people on the internet here, who all has played the game Coin Droids? Man, every single person in the room. That's incredible. <laughs> wow. I, I didn't know it was that popular. That's amazing. Thank you, everyone. There was two. Oh, when I was playing, I found that you needed a critical mass of players. Like, you noted that I can sit and wait for its health to be low and its bounty to be high, such that it's an opportune moment to attack. Eventually, I discovered that there weren't enough of those, so we came a game of waiting to his people to let their health fall to that level. Yeah. And where there weren't enough players, that wait not really long. So the, the, the problem that Andrew is mentioning is that the game requires a network effect. Absolutely. And that's why we've had so much success at DEF CON. Because at DEF CON, we get to work with people, get them their first wallets, get them their first coins, they're excited to play, and we actually have like 100, 150 people playing at the same time. And it makes for this super fun game Everyone actually really enjoys it. People are writing scripts. Humans are playing it on their phones. People are playing it on their laptop. We got people writing Python, Bash, all sorts of crap going on. People are actually enjoying the game. We see it, we get excited, and then five days after the conference, it kind of like fizzles out a little bit. So there's there's certainly um, things we have to work on to keep that network effect going. Uh, but we do see in-person events is where it excels the most. People have people have a good time trying to snipe those kills from each other because that's the whole point is trying to like bait someone else into attacking a different droid and then either killing both of them and taking all their money or letting it happen and, and, and waste their own money depending on the situation. So it definitely, uh, it's not a fun one player game and unfortunately we don't have the user base right now for it to be a fun multi, or for it to be a, uh, a multiplayer game most of the times. Um, but I mean, hopefully these things grow in time what we're working on right now, as we as we look at all these different technologies and we watch them mature, and we're excited about these technologies, be it Plasma, be it Lightning, be it all these other smart contract platforms, what we're really waiting for while we're doing it is figuring out how the hell do we make a good user experience with all of this. Right now, someone comes to Coindroids.com, we're like, hey, welcome, you got crypto? Like, no, I don't know what that is. We're like, go away. <laughs> it's, it's not a great user experience, like it's a real problem. Or, hey, you got crypto? Yeah, yeah, I got crypto, great. So put your Litecoin here. And they're like, no, I, I don't have Litecoin. 
Or, oh, I don't know, Litecoin's down right now. Like, I don't want to spend my Litecoin. Oh, okay. Or, you know, during 2017, hey, Litecoin's up right now. I don't really want to spend my Litecoin. <laughs> like, there's, it, it's a fun space to be in trying to create products that you think people will like because it's not working. Um, but that's why, as much as I love looking at all these different technologies, user experience is the real thing that we've been spending all of our time trying to figure out how to solve. Um, and I, I doubt I'm the only person in the room who is working on something and thinking that exact same thing. I'm seeing a lot of nods, so. <laughs> Great, well, that's it. I think we've got a nice long break now. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, everyone, online. All right, everybody, as I said, we're going to move into the longer break now, so this is your last chance to get in that weird thing that blows the air around or the bills fly and you try and catch them. Yeah, remember that thing from your childhood? Yeah. Ooh, the audience is filling out with some nice faces. All right, uh, so we'll see you guys all in an hour. We're going to end the live stream, and we'll pick back up with our last few presentations from GeoCoin, Engine Coin, and, oh, of course, and, and Word Exchange.